what if the Russians could monkey around with our power grid? Some evidence here that they are trying the fallout if they succeed, because in some cases they already are, cybersecurity expert Morgan Wright. So you, you hit a power grid, what would go out along the way? Look, that's the one thing. I don't think they've really gamed it out to say exactly what would happen, but you'd have these series of cascading events. For example, we know one of the things that happens when the heat goes up. I was just out in Phoenix, 114 degrees. They've got a massive uh, impact on their power grid. If you have one thing goes out, you have the most vulnerable people in our society, the elderly, uh, maybe people in nursing homes, places to where heat does kill people. So you, you're going to have these heat-related deaths. You'll have an impact on public safety, on services. The biggest thing you'll have is you'll start creating unrest in the society, some, a little bit of chaos. And we know what happens. If you want to take out a nation, as we've seen in war or terrorist activities, go after power, go after water. If you go after our power, you start affecting a lot of the things that we've come to depend on, everything from communications to uh, our banking to, uh, you know, you know, don't want to create such a doomsday scenario, but think of one thing that doesn't require power to operate. So one of the things I've learned with our grid is it, it's sort of strung together. A lot of people think that it's a sophisticated network of, of utilities <laughs> and all of that. Right. But, but when one goes out, it's sort of like, you know, a limb that goes out and another limb that goes out. And then right. before you know it, you're, you're in intensive care. Um, and we're vulnerable to that because these have not been fixed, addressed, or even updated. In some case, I think in, in Northern California, I was reading, in, in um, decades. So then what? Well, look, um, back in March, I wrote an article at The Hill about how Russia, this is a warm-up for them. If you want to see what's happening, again, watch uh, what's happening in Ukraine. What you're going to see is, example, what happened, I think it was back in 2004 when we had the massive power outage. You guys were hit with it in New York. Right, I remember. Guess where it started? Ohio. It started in Ohio and worked its all its way out and took out a lot, large chunk of New York City. Now, have they made uh, progress? Yes, they have. But if we're still falling victim to the same three-card Monty trick, which is they're using spear phishing, they're taking taking over accounts. This network that we're talking about in the DHS report was supposed to be air-gapped. In other words, the front office wasn't supposed to be connected to the systems that run the power. How did they get into it? The same way that the Target hack happened. They used third parties, like the HVAC vendors. They had people that had remote right. control software installed. So we still, for all the money they spent, and they haven't learned that lesson, man, I'll tell you, that's a waste of money. They could have spent half of that and just done some basic stuff and being 10 times farther than where they are right now. But wouldn't the Russians know more people than ever are watching them, the more are clued in that, 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 that they want to do something so they'd be yep. extra cautious if they do it at all? Yeah, you're not, like I said, you're not going to see them swinging for the bleachers, but what you're going to see are little things, little nudges, things just to continue to cause disruption, low-intensity conflict. The U.S. is expanding its overseas military presence. According to Marine Corps General Joseph Dunford, there are now 300,000 personnel in 177 countries. That's up from 200,000 last year. Many of those troops are based in other NATO countries. Those include almost 35,000 in Germany and 12,000 in Italy. The U.S. also operates numerous bases in Asia, in allied states, including Japan and South Korea, and in war zones such as Afghanistan. In tonight's Whatever Happened To segment, President Trump's military parade here in Washington. It is shaping up to be something a little different than originally planned. National security correspondent Jennifer Griffin tells us where things stand right now. The date is set, Saturday, November 10th, one day before Veterans Day. But the military parade in Washington may not be what President Trump had in mind when he watched French fighter jets and tanks parading down the Champs-Élysées in Paris last summer, sparking his idea to honor America's veterans. Language in the Defense Authorization Act passed in Congress this week prohibits forces from taking part that may be needed for war. Quote, to ensure that veterans and those currently serving remain the parade's focus and that efforts to restore readiness are not slowed. The NDAA prohibits the use of operational units or equipment in the parade if the Secretary of Defense believes such use will hamper readiness. The money will come from the military's operations and maintenance budget, according to the Republican chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. It says if any operational units are used, then Secretary Mattis has to certify that it will not affect readiness. 
The Pentagon's top officer has assigned U.S. Northern Command, based in Colorado, tasked with protecting the homeland to pull it off. Initial guidance in March called for, quote, honoring the history of the U.S. military starting from the Revolutionary War. Demise would be you know, kind of up, up, up to the public to decide. We are wondering what is happening to the world. Everything is changing. The very idea of human being some sort of natural concept is really going to change. Our bodies will be so high tech we won't be able to really distinguish between what's natural and what's artificial. Inside our own heads is the most complex arrangement of matter in the known universe. You might ask yourself, can we get to be superhumans? The original Industrial Revolution was driven by the discovery that you could use steam engines to do all kinds of interesting things. But that was followed by additional revolutions for electricity and computers and communications technology. We're now in the early stages of the fourth Industrial Revolution, which is bringing together digital, physical, and biological systems. One of the features of this fourth Industrial Revolution is that it doesn't change what we are doing but it changes us. With the ability to visualize brain activity, for example, through a simple consumer-based EEG device, it gives us access to ourselves in ways that we've never before thought possible. It unlocks the black box that is the brain and enables us to um, really, truly be able to uh, realize an identity that is aspirational. There's now a scientific foundation for the effects of mindfulness on the brain, on the genome, on biological aging. And when the human mind does know itself, then you get the potential for a new renaissance that restructures itself in terms of our relationship to life, our relationship to the planet, our relationship to work. We need a different economic model. And by that, I don't mean capitalism versus communism. What I'm talking about is a shift in the system along the lines of the two big changes that happened in the 20th century, Keynesianism, with a much greater focus on health and education and the role of government working with business, and then a reaction against that in late century to neoliberalism, where the focus was on free markets, freedom of the individual, and getting governments out of the way. We need a shift to a new system that will allow us to meet the basic needs of every human on the planet, that will live within planetary means, that will be fairer, and that will be focused as its key goal, not on growth per se, but on maximizing human well-being. And history tells us that a value shift is triggered by creation of a new story about how we want to live. I see the circular economy as something which fits very closely with mankind's goal to be innovative and creative and to always progress. We can use asset tracking, we can use IT, we can use 3D printing to enable this different economic model to recover materials, feed them back into the economy and really to decouple growth from the resource constraints we have. The reason we live in cities is not different today than it was 10,000 years ago. Even if we have got networks connecting us, we still want to have places where we meet in person. Well, this means the place where we work and the place where we live are much closer to each other, a city where we don't need to have big supply chains in order to produce things, where many things can be sourced locally thanks to 3D printing and robotics. So if we are able to do something to transform cities, to make them more efficient, then the impact can be huge. Think about the prospect of getting rid of plastics. We must not only be inspired or informed by nature, but actually use natural organisms with which to design products and building parts. Only instead of varying material properties, we're varying biological functionality. Design is critical today because it's the first signal of human intention. So the question of 
adding quality to quantity. It isn't a matter of simply circulating things that are potentially toxic. It's circulating things that are safe and healthy for all generations. So the goal is no longer, I want to be less bad, less monotonous, less unsafe, less unjust. It's really about a diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, clean water, clean soil, clean energy. Together we are fighting to preserve our fragile climate from irreversible damage and devastation of unthinkable proportions. If we think about the original Industrial Revolution, it was an energy revolution. I like to think of it as a kind of bookending of a period in human history during which we used fossil fuels and it worked very well for us for a long time. But now we have to bring that to an end. We have energy technologies that can power our civilization, solar, wind, uh, biomass. So then the question is, well, how do we get good integration? Maybe the wind is blowing in Denmark, the sun is shining in Germany, and now you can move that electricity through an integrated grid. You can supply energy to everyone who needs it, and you can supply energy at all times. see different stuff as um, far as like the body marriage line. They use a lot of things that help them lift up and move things to the car. You just sit there and you know program something and if it has its own set mind to go ahead and do everything and then as humans we just come in and take the extra step to help the technology. It's not the, the cure-all for everything. There's definitely a lot of things where people perform the operation better, but certainly for the right applications, robotics are a huge improvement for the process. The prediction of five million jobs lost by 2020 to technology is serious, but it's not the main question. Construction, manufacturing, services, public health and education, these industries will still exist. The main question is, what will be the future of work? How will we define work? How will we share the wealth? Uh, from the viewpoint of the, the labor or jobs, now the, uh, we really need a new education or new training. We're working with a world in motion in FIRST Robotics, trying to encourage you know, students from third grade all the way up through uh, the end of high school. We um, had students make sailboats, and then we had them race them, and so they could see how quickly they could move. And they immediately went back and started to say, oh, I saw what happened, I'm going to go change this or that. And that was third graders. I just given a prize to a kid of 18 years old that has discovered something really very, very unique. Came up with how to get better productivity and better yields for seeds of corn. And so he basically came with the idea that if you would perforate these seeds, you would get more food. And uh, you think about it and say, but he didn't go to university. So how does he get all that knowledge? And he told me, I mean, I've been watching YouTube since the age of 12 and I'm so interested that I've seen everything about it. I've read everything about it. The world is really open uh, to learning. The thing is, uh, how do you give the incentive to your kids to do that? It's this ability of digital technology to change outcomes, to truly empower people all over the world that can create a more equitable growth, because I think the world needs that. Fourth Industrial Revolution has the potential to make inequalities visible and to make them less acceptable in the future and hopefully to gather and garner political support to take the necessary decision to reduce the gap. Humans have always been using tools, but because of the recent advances in technology, we're beginning to have machines that can augment us in all sorts of interesting ways. I was the first person in the world to be able to voluntarily move my legs while stepping in a robot by exciting the nervous system using electrical stimulators directly onto the spine. We believe that a cure will be possible if enough of the right people have the will to fast track a cure for paralysis.
We take two things from the patient. Um, first, we take a three-dimensional x-ray and we extract the three-dimensional data out of that so we can make a perfectly shaped puzzle piece. And then we also take a sample of fat tissue from the patient so that we can extract the stem cells out of those. And we use those stem cells with this three-dimensional scaffold that we fabricate and after three weeks we have a piece of living bone that's uh, ready for implantation. Being able to use genome editing to understand the genetic changes that lead to cancer and technologies like uh, drug delivery, getting molecules into particular types of cells, there's a lot of excitement about being able to move much more quickly on this disease. One of the things that I think is so essential to free and open societies is freedom of thought. Um, and up until now, the conversation we've been having is around freedom of speech. Once we can access people's thoughts and access people's emotions, um, we have to create a space that enables people to think freely, to think divergent thoughts, to think creative thoughts. And in a society where people fear having those thoughts, uh, the likelihood of being able to enjoy progress is significantly diminished. We need to take responsibility at every level of society, from the individual and the personal to the institutional to the global, to adapt to these technological challenges and changes, which are redefining what it means to be human, what it means to work, what it means to be completely embedded in this world. People always ask me if I'm an optimist or a pessimist. The technology exists, but how do we get it and implement it at the scale we need, at a price that people around the world can afford. Even though we have everyday problems, we have to solve, we have to find a way to lay the foundations for the innovations of tomorrow.